Hello there, my fellow Inner Sphere engineers, and welcome to some more Battletech lore. In keeping with some of the more recent videos on battle armor, today we arrive at a video dedicated to House Marek, and their more or less Free Worlds League. You might also be happy to find out that today we're not governing two designs, but three. They are the Achilles, the Phalanx, and the Ogre. These are not the only FWL designs, but hopefully I picked up some diverse and interesting ones regardless. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The first one of today's designs is the Achilles, massing at 3 quarters of a ton only, and a cost of 320,000 sea bills. The Achilles was in fact jointly designed by the scientists of the Free Worlds League and the World of Blake, with the goal of creating a new light battle armor that could easily be mass-produced. Inspired by the Federated Commonwealth's ultimately flawed Infiltrator Mark I, the research team used the Blake's Tornado as the basis for the new suit, while seeking to overcome some of its defects. Starting in October 3054, the team would labor for many months, reworking the Tornado to add armoring, weapons, and integrated jump jets, while still maintaining some stealth aspects. As prototypes become available in May of 3055, the task was harder to implement without making too many sacrifices though. A breakthrough eventually came. According to rumors, the World of Blake ROM organization acquired patented information held by Defiance Industries and the New Avalon Institute of Science and this was regarding a new composite armor formula. Using the information, the team was able to sheave the Achilles in armor that met the protection standards set by the Free World Zig military, while also maintaining an acceptable level of stealth. Both the FWLM and the World of Blake militia began fielding the Achilles after its introduction in July 3057. Its first combat operation was believed to be the Blake's conquest of Terra in 3058. Production of the original was carried out by Iran Technologies on Iran, while a few years later the Free Worlds like Defense Industries would start building a new variant specifically for the Blakists on Gibson. Although Defiance Industries would protest the theft of their technology, their effort was delayed by the onset of the Fedcom Civil War, and would ultimately end with the collapse of the League. The Achilles did see a lot of use by both the League and the Blakists in the Jihad. The main weapon of the Achilles is a modular weapon mount in the right arm. Although a wide range of weapons can be carried, the most common of these are a flamer, a small laser, or a machine gun, with a light tag becoming available in 3059. On the left arm it has an anti-personnel weapon mount, typically a submachine gun just above the wrist. Both the arms end in fully functional basic manipulators which are slaved directly to the operator's own hands, giving it more flexibility in holding and manipulating objects than other battle armor suits. While this does come at the cost of armor protection and hand-to-hand -hand combat, the capability is invaluable in supporting battlefield infiltration missions. Integral jump jets in the Achilles allow it to leap up to 90 meters at a time, giving it good maneuverability. Its 360 or 793 pounds of improved stealth armor, while allowing the wearer to survive a couple of shots from a small laser, are most notable for their stealth features. Combining the aspects of an electronic and infrared suppressor sneak suit, the stealth system can run indefinitely and protect the suit from being detected by several sensor types, including Beagle Active Probes. The Gauss Rifle variant was introduced after the Felcom Civil War in 3064, using a David Light Gauss Rifle as the main weapon. Produced for the World of Blake on Gibson in 3064, another variant sacrifices its firepower for superior electronic systems. It removes the modular weapon mount and frees up enough weight to install improved sensors and an ECM suite. The second of today's designs is the Phalanx, weighing at 1.5 tons and a cost of 439,000 sea bells. Although starting later than the Federated Commonwealth and the Draconis Combine in battle armor research and development, 
the FWLM quickly surpassed the other houses, coming out with the acclaimed and highly coveted Longinus and Achilles suits. While some of that was from their own military-industrial complex, much of the armor composites in the advanced stealth systems were developed with the assistance of the Word of Blake, who had their own success with their tornado suit. What the Free Worlds League was lacking, though, was a heavy support suit, such as the bigger Fenrir and Kanazuchi suits. These had proven themselves feasible despite their mobility problems and weight issues after the Free Worlds League decided that lighter and more compact suits would be the trend. Wary of tying themselves further to the increasingly ambitious Word of Blake, the FWLM, in contrast to the past practices, first made several attempts to complete the design of their own. However, many designs problems appeared seemingly out of the blue, delaying the project. Strange problems, ranging from processor suites constantly breaking to the Mimer musculature regularly failing during the trials, would plague the program and threaten its existence. Eventually, the military did allow the World of Blake technical teams to enter the program and troubleshoot the design. In suspiciously record time, the assistants solved all the problems, resulting in a first-rate design, by inner sphere standards anyway. Despite having no jump jets, the improved mobility of the phalanx, coupled with the battle claw that it carried to Mount Omnimex, allowed it to keep pace with many other forces. Its firepower is just as impressive, with four shoulder-mounted short-range missile tubes. Also carried is the deadly King David Gauss rifle, which, while not as formidable as the Federated Sun's developed magshot, is less heavy. To mask its approach into firing range, the improved stealth armor hides it from any systems, and also provides ample protection against all but the heaviest battle-mounted weapons. An armored glove on the right hand allows troopers to perform more precise actions, from handling lighter anti-personnel weapons to keypads and external data pads, and even lockpicks when trying to break into a locked installation. In exchange for their help, the Word of Blake would have the right to use the new design as well, which would work well with their other stealthy designs. Because of that, during the development of the suit, the Blakeists also created the B variant of the design. They swapped the Gauss out for their newly developed Mech Taser rifle and extra hardening of the electronics for protection from devastating feedback of using the Taser rifle. With the exception of the Free Worlds units that have joined the World of Blake Protectorate, very few units were able to get their hands on that variant. Instead of simply fielding the Phalanx A, the Blake is also employed another model after that, the Phalanx C. This one sported a heavy mortar and a Word of Blake copy of the Magshot. The Phalanx A could supply long-range direct and indirect fire of the battlesuits, while the B would often focus on capturing high-value battlefield targets, typically commanders of units and disabling the vehicles of key targets. Finally, there was a Phalanx D. This one had a battle claw and a medium pulse laser. Finally for today, we have the Ogre, massing at 1.5 tons and an unknown cost. The first entry of Tvastar Enterprises in the battle armor market the Ogre was initially intended to supplement slower vehicle platoons and fill in the gaps in the Regulan planetary militia. The prevalence of non-battle mech units in the post-Jihad conflicts saw the Ogre perform far better than the fledgling Tvastar expected. This, in turn, would lead to wide exports beyond the Regulan thief's borders. Despite evidence to the contrary, the Ogre had developed a fanciful but fearsome reputation for literally tearing tanks in half on the battlefield. Sporting an unusually wide frame and paired heavy battle claws, the battlesuit exudes an intimidating battlefield presence. While this does afford a psychological advantage against conventional infantry, it is actually ill-equipped to fight infantry. Its short-range missiles allow it to perform in an anti-armor role and its armor coverage allows the wearer to withstand all but the heaviest tank-mounted weapons. The Ogre is also available in an interdictor armor and electronic warfare package. This equipment allows the battlesuit to maneuver into better positions than its standard cousins, but a smaller SRM magazine limits extended battlefield operation. Ever since it was unveiled as Tvastar's flagship battle armor, 
The ogre's success saw large production runs exported to the Duchy of Andurian and to the Lyran Commonwealth. The first real test of the ogre, though, came in 3095, when the 10th Regulan Hussars conducted an exploratory raid on the Oriente Protectorate world of Emrys IV. The 10th, still under the stigma of the Blakist collusion during the Jihad, went out of its way to prove its loyalty to the Regulan thieves. What was initially meant as a saber-rattling tactic saw the 10th overstepping its established mission parameters and crossing swords with the Steel Guard. Three of the 10th Ogre squads were attempting to secure an escape route when a short platoon of Vedette tanks ambushed them in a defile a few kilometers from their rendezvous point. Using their daunting and unexpected size to their advantage, two Ogre squads drew the tank's attention, while a squad of Interdictor Ogres employed their mimetic camouflage and jockeyed into position. Well-placed strikes to the rear armor disabled two of the tank's motive systems and the ogres advanced on the immobile units. The combination of the surviving vedette's battle rom camera footage, SRM detonations, and a little imagination would give birth to the ogres' ability of tank shredding. The securing of the pass allowed the tent to retreat in regular space with only a small amount of embarrassment. A member of the Rasselhaeg Dominion's 283rd Battle Cluster, one star captain, Idris Deviar, would use his ogre battlesuits with frightening effectiveness. By pairing them with a Dasher Omnimech, Deviar's point can easily reach places in enemy lines to exploit them. Analysts are uncertain how a small batch of regular manufactured ogres even ended up in the Dominion Tumen, but Deviar adopted them for their intimidating battlefield presence. Star Colonel Peter Lankenau initially called for a trial of grievance against the inclusion of ogres in Deviar's command point, but the ogres' performance in the trial silenced the Star Colonel's reservations. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these variants of Marek battle armor, the ogre, the phalanx, and the Achilles for today. Quite a varied bunch, both in looks and capability. There's also several other unique variants to describe, so I'll inevitably be returning to this topic eventually. What about you? I do look forward to reading your thoughts on these variants too. Which one did you find the most interesting? Did you ever use any of these in your own games? Do write it down in the comments below. If you enjoyed the episode and found it informative, please leave a like, share and subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot for watching and have an awesome and healthy day. This is GDN signing out.